everyone. Welcome to the Mom Series, The Misunderstanding of Multiplicity. My name is Maria. Happy Monday and happy March. Um, so I thought today I would do a craft day. So I kind of parley into the subject I'm talking about into a craft. And uh, I've been wanting to make this blanket called An Italian Story, which I have here. And I found this when I was Googling an Italian recipe. I was looking up a very old Italian recipe called strafuli or strafuldo, which is something I made for Christmas Eve a couple of times, and I, I knew some ladies that used to make it when I was younger, and I was looking up that, actually, and this, so you never know what you're going to get. And this was in the corner, because I do a lot of knitting and crochet. Those ads follow you around, and Red Heart was following me around, and there was an Italian story. Or a red heart. Okay, so this, when you walk into a Mediterranean home, any home really, it's sort of like a chevron or a ribble blanket. These are very common. These like basket weave, just knit, girl, kind of box blanket. They're awesome. They're awesome for lap cans, which is what I make a lot of. Um, I donate a lot of, excuse me, um, lap blankets to the Wilmot Center and also to, um, that's just a, a little cancer, not a little cancer, it's a big cancer center. Um, and the Lips in another one. And then uh, a dialysis unit, which is really close to us. Because when people are going through kidney dialysis, they get very cold. And um, they have strict, strict rules about the kind of lap cams you can donate. You can't use wool. Um, you have to be very careful not to use uh, animal fiber because um, um, a lot of people have allergies. So I'm always looking for acrylic and a really easy blanket to make. And this is just a little sample so I can show you um, how to work it. But I wanted to tell you what I'm going to do with my blanket and a little story about this blanket. So they have like really strict um, dimensions, like 38 by, I believe it's 43, because they have to fit, um, don't quote me on that, I'll have to look it up. Um, so I have it on a postcard somewhere. Um, where you don't want to get the blanket caught in a person's wheelchair. So a lot of people that are getting these lap blankets, they just go right over their lamp, their, their lap and down their legs or up around them and down, but the wheels have to be able to keep moving, not get caught. So I'm always looking for a good pattern for that, but more than anything, when I saw this, it's like, holy moly, where have I seen that before? Well, I was in therapy for 28 plus years, which is what I talk about, <laughs> with one therapist. And in his office, he had a rocking chair and a blanket just like this. And when we did very hard work, very the grunt work of therapy, and got to those maybe aha moments later, but down in the mud, crawling to get there, um, I would get very cold, and I would start shivering and shaking. My teeth would be chattering, and. Um, many, it could be 90 degrees out. You, I could not get warm, no matter what. And I always wore long sleeves anyways, because I had become a self-harmer and was already making a mess of my wrists and my arms. So I always liked to cover those scars anyways. Um, his He had air conditioning in his office, so I always wore long sleeves and a sweater, and I would still be like, because... Going back and going back to that trauma not only brings up the nausea, the vomiting, the cramping, the body pains, the somatic things that went on in the body, the feelings that we disconnected from, but all those emotions, feelings, and then body feelings too. So I literally would have times where I, I shook like a terrorized child as a grown adult. And I couldn't understand it. It embarrassed me um, when we were doing work. I wouldn't want him to look at my face. I would want the chair. We would turn the chair around. I'd be like, I can't. I didn't want him to see me having any emotion. 
I didn't want him to see me cry. Um, it was really huge that I didn't, that my face had no emotion, that my face just completely was blank. Now I do have an altar called the face. I also want to have one called the mouth. So when I was younger, if I looked, um, if I looked like I was in shock, or like I saw something really bad, um, I somehow developed, I mean, really young, like three or four. Look at that face. Look at that face. Go, oh, look at her face. Look at that face. Don't look at me with that face. That kind of thing. That mouth of yours. That mouth's going to get in trouble. That mouth. Um, these were things that were said to me by one of my parents. And very, like, I was pre-verbal. And I created, subconsciously, which we've talked about, altars. One was named the mouth and one was named the face. Um, now, the face was blank. That's what the altar was all about, just being able to put on a stoic presentation. And I did that all through high school and, and grammar school and everything. I, I very often just, well, my mom would say, Maria wouldn't say shit if she had a mouthful. And I didn't. Back then, I didn't talk at all. I just kind of hung out with the adults. I didn't know how to be with kids because I hadn't been with kids that much. I was around kids in my family, but I really didn't know how to interact and play with them. I, cause my mother really kept me by her side. Um, and so she was very vigilant of my emotions and what I said and um, how I acted. So she was very aware of that, hyper vigilant to every little thing. So um, I learned to really guard my face, my mouth, what came out of my mouth. Um, took me years of therapy to finally start just speaking and not worrying about how it came out sounding. Um, didn't matter if it sounded like gibberish or um, if I was talking sideways in a conversation. <laughs> Um, whatever it was, it was more authentic than, um, biting my tongue and holding my mouth in check. Um, during all of this therapy that was really hard, like I said, I would shiver and I would shake and I would not want to see my therapist and I would just be in pain. And, um, oftentimes if something came up at the end of a therapy session um then I had to drive home and my therapist wouldn't want me to drive in that condition so but he had another client coming in so he'd have me go sit in the waiting room and make sure just sit for a while make sure I was okay because I mean I would be trembling so in my therapist's office over over the rocking chair was this this blanket the story of the blanket and how energy and trauma and everything can get locked into something but it can also become we, we can make anything become a comfort to us and the meaning that we apply to that is really important so um during that whole period of time he would like uh, he would know that I had my jacket on. Sometimes it would be winter. I'd have my coat on. I'd still be like, you know. And he would um, offer me this blanket. And for a long time, I wouldn't accept it from him. I wouldn't. I would just be like, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I wouldn't accept that help. Just that generous, here, take the blanket. I'd be like, no. Um, but... When I had to go for a medical procedure I didn't want to go for, I thought, well, let's make this session about this. I'm not going. <laughs> That's it. I'm not having this medical procedure. I don't care. It was very clear that I needed this. It was a surgery that I needed, and I was going to be awake for most of it. And um, it was about an hour-long procedure, and I was like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it. Part of my job is to help you get well physically and emotionally. And um, 
I can't make you do anything, well, that part, but his job was, but I would have to do the work. So, and I think, you know, we give our therapists a lot of um, power and we look at them sometimes as magical, like they're going to fix us, but we're actually doing the work. They're, they're kind of just guiding us. And it's important to remember that, that we really are able to, with their help, do the work. Our, the, the work is being done really ourselves. So um, I was aware of that, having been a social worker, and I didn't want to grow too dependent on him. And there came a time in my life when suddenly it was like lights out. Like now it wasn't about multiple personality. Now it wasn't about um, DID. Now it wasn't about any of that. It was about now my children were elsewhere. Now I lost being a mother, being a, a social worker. I, I was just no work, no children. I was just like, oh my God, this is all there is to do is therapy. This is all there is to do is therapy. And it was enough. It was a lot. And I wouldn't have been able to do one or the other without having some help for me with parenting and also taking care of my physical and emotional health. Um, so I had to have this procedure done. That was part of it. It was like, okay, we can fix all the emotional, but you got a lot going on with your body that needs to be fixed. So... I wouldn't go for the procedure. I was just like, nope, not going. And <laughs> we started working on why, why, what can I do to help you was his, his weekly, sometimes twice a week, three times. What can I say to help you get there and get through this procedure? I don't know. I don't know. But that procedure is not happening to me. Okay. Um, what can the doctors, nurses say to you to make you feel okay, safe, protected? So nothing, nothing, because they're going to hurt me. They're going to say I can trust them. They're going to say I'm safe. They're going to say this will only last a minute, and it's all a lie. <laughs> he agreed. Said, you're right, you're right. That's stuff they say to make you feel better. So what does the younger Maria need that was hurt that I see always shivering when we're doing the work and turning away and trying to like comfort yourself but won't take comfort from me? And um I said, what would make me feel better is to be able to bury myself in blankets like this. Now, my dad and I had talked about this a while ago. We had a really honest conversation. He said, Maria, when you were about three years old and I saw you scoot under the dining room table and be like, all crunched up like this. He said, I knew then. He said, and then by the time you were six, seven, you were still under the table. Like that and because dinner time had become like a war zone around our table so um and I used to sleep with the covers like up over my head at night and um I said blankets blankets lots of blankets warmth protected blanket me with like it's like a big like hug where I can hide. Okay. Started offering me this blanket whenever we were doing hard work, productive hard work, getting to the the grunt root of the, the stuff, right? Okay, so I take the blanket home. One day he says, take the blanket home. So I take the blanket home. And it's an anniversary time, so really rough time. I take the blanket home. And I'm walking around on it, and I'm pouring a cup of coffee. And it's not even got a little cream or sugar in it yet. Black coffee right down the side. I'm like, I didn't know anything about, you know, knitting and crocheting then. And I didn't know anything about wool, other than I could go buy some wool. Like, there was a little bit of wool in here. Like, 
2%, which is why I could wear it. If there was more, I couldn't. Anyways, I knew this was made for my doctor by either his grandma who had passed away or his mom who had passed away or his sister now who had passed away or his his mother-in-law who had passed away or his first wife. Somebody very special to him made this to him for him when he graduated medical school and I, knew, I just knew that it was always there and he's a keeper. He um, he's had, he had the same calendar from the first day I met him. Um, he always had like a little leather uh, top to it and he would go get the fillers to go in it. So like appointment book calendar. All those years he never changed his calendar book. All those years he never changed his furniture in the, in the office until the very end. All those years his desk was just the same. Everything was just the same, the same, the same, the same. And um, so I was like, oh, this means something. He would wear the same sandals. I mean, the man never had a new pair of shoes. He always had the same sandals in the summertime. I was like, this is so special to him. I've got to get it to him. Well, look, look, you can see right here. When the coffee, <laughs> I got it right into the water and started doing this. Worst thing you could do. Open it up. And it made a little pilling with a hole in a couple of spots. I took it to a dry cleaner. It made me sign paperwork saying they could make it worse instead of better. Um, I tried to match the yarn perfectly. I looked all over for the yarn. At that time, I didn't have Google or any of this. So I just went to like all kind of yarn shops and looked. And you can see this was never there. Right? Now, I know now how to fix this. Easy fix. Then, I didn't know. Instead, I said to him, I meant to bring you back your blanket. He said, it's okay, next time bring you back. I need to bring you back your blanket. You know, next time bring you back. I, said, I have to tell you something. I spilled coffee on it. It's ruined. So, how does spilling coffee on it make it ruin? I said, I, said, I tried to wash it. It's okay. I said, I overwashed it. I like, <laughs> and then it got pilling, and then it got snarly, and then it got holes in places. And I could kind of fix some of the holes with a crochet hook, but there's other spots that are just popping out. And look at this thing. There's nothing wrong with this blanket. And this is what growing older will teach us, right? Do you see any copy on there now? Right here. Right here. A little bit. So I'm going to give it one more soaking. But he would have accepted. He was like, it's okay. Just get, I'll wash it. This is after even dry cleaning. That still, that spot is there. Um, it's a lovely blanket. Right? I told him I ruined it. Because in my eyes, I had made such a big... I had really ruined it. There was no fixing it. And I was not going to give him back a bad blanket. Um, it wasn't until and he said, I said, he said, just bring it the way it is. I was like, it's really bad. He said, okay. And I thought about that. I packed it away and I kept thinking I'm going to find the yarn and I'm going to, I'm going to make it or I'm going to bring it to somebody that knows that pattern, right? And I saw this. It is basically the same thing. This one is doing a combination of blocks in pearl and knitting, seven stitches. There's a first set of blocks and a second set of blocks. Only difference with this blanket is, I'll show you the border. And this is just a sample, a small sample to show you. And it's kind of squinched up. The border begins with a 10 row double moss stitch. And then on the sides, you have that double moth coming up the side, and then you go into the into the blacks. And the blacks are, like I said, seven stitch blocks of pearl knit and then alternating. So I'm going to show you how quick this works up. Now what Red Heart has done with the Italian Story Dream 
uh, design team is they used Ore, a uh, yarn called Ore. And let me get the color here. Put my glasses on. That will help. I probably will put them on. Where is my glasses? All right. Glasses on. I'm okay. So they're using Ore, 12 balls, in the color 5360 Caramello. Caramello. It is a six super bulky and it's 3.50 ounces. All right. I'm using this is six super bulky. I'm using Red Heart Super Saver for medium worsted weight yarn. This is a seven ounce skein. It looks like a whole lot more, right? I've bumped it up. I've done what's called Navajo knitting. So I've bumped it up to a six. Let me show you what that is real quick. So I mean, we apply meaning to things um, when we're going through the process of getting over our path to moving forward, right? And it's important uh, that we know when the time is over, we don't need those things anymore. Just like there's a time and a season for people in our life and then and then it's over with. Sad to say. There will be, uh, you know, Ecclesiastes talks about that. Time and season for everything, for everybody under the sun. And, and that doesn't mean death. That means, you know, we might have a relationship where it's just time to move on. I remember when we ended therapy, we didn't close really neat because he left it open for me. Like any relationship, no need to sever it and end it completely. He left it like, let's not think of this as a goodbye. Let's think of this as a graduation. And we can run into each other and we can see each other if you need to pick up the phone, if you need advice at some time, if you want to come back in for anything else. And I, ha I have... I have picked up the phone. I have gone back in. So, I mean, that's the way to do therapy if you're forever, you know, you're not getting anywhere. Um, and, and there comes a time, too, when a therapist or a social worker or counselor knows, I've gone as far as I can go with this client. They're not at a place where they're ready to remember and deal with that trauma. And that's okay because in our system, we have we have this protective where when we finally do remember it and it comes out all whatever it is that is from the past when it finally starts leaking out of our body in panic attacks and insomnia and and stomach problems and back aches and pelvic pain and neck pain and all kinds of weird ways we held ourselves when we were scared when all that comes out it's safe for it to come out and we're releasing all those toxins and we're getting healthy uh, but it looks very unhealthy and it's very unproductive and it feels very unhealthy but that is us getting the toxins of that energy of that trauma out and finally connecting to the feelings and feeling them and then you can say I was telling somebody this the other day now I look at everything from a a godly perspective, a spiritual perspective, but I don't over spiritualize things. I used to, but I don't now. Uh, she was posting about forgiveness and how a friend of mine uh, about how Jesus forgave so many times, right? And I went right to what I always have wondered. Jesus said, "How many times should you forgive your brother?" Okay, seven times. <laughs> Matthew was having seven times. And Jesus said, I say, seven times 70. So I was writing and I wasn't trying to be snippy or debateful or anything. I wrote, that has left me to ponder for years. Because I know darn well. I have at least forgiven 490 times. So I think I'm at my max. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you what. Once you know in your heart, and if, if you if you do, you're keeping a record of wrongdoing, and then you're like an injustice collector. So either way, you got work to do on your inside. So I do. I know I do. But I have said, Lord, you know I have forgiven 
over 490 times. And the Lord said right back to me, well, you shouldn't be keeping a record of it. <laughs> so, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> but I was like, it's okay not to forgive this person right now and to be angry because you know what? I don't want to falsely forgive them. So, I've always struggled with that. Well, I've gotten to the 490. Can I just not forgive this person? Can I just stay pissed off? Only hurting yourself. Okay, so all we can do is make healthy boundaries and um, not be snippy and nasty. That's about it. Um, so I always, I always look at that. But anyways, I'm gonna make this blanket because um, I began therapy in the spring, and I want to make this for him a chunky version, and then. I've got a yarn that's similar to this. I'm going to wash it one more time and then do a duplicate stitch over that little tiny area that to me, I felt like if I gave that back to him in that condition, it wasn't clean enough. It was ruined. And that's wrong. But I also want to talk about energy real quick. Um, the name of my book that I've been writing for years is called Talking Houses. Eventually, this channel will just switch over to Talking Houses. That'll be the name of the title of the channel. It won't be Awesome Astrid Mosaics. It'll just be Talking Houses. Because I'm just going to be uh, releasing that in installments with me reading it out here. Um, the reason I call it Talking Houses is we leave our good memories and our bad memories in the houses we spent our time. Um, Many times when you move from a house, you feel the need to go back and look, and go in and look. Or maybe you're buying a new house and you wonder about who lived here, what went on here. So you do a little cleanse. You either have a priest come over and anoint the house with holy oil, or you smudge, or you get a bunch of elders and people together to pray over the house. I've always done that. Um, but when you disassociate, in a trauma and bad things happen right alongside very good things and you disconnected from the bad you left part of you in that house um, so we talk about ghosts um, after people die but there's a lot of energy in a home that was very if, if, if a home was very chaotic um, we can move into a home and just never feel peaceful in that home. And it's not that anybody's dead or haunting the house. That is the energy of the house. Um, and if we're we're empath, we're going to pick up on that. So um, for me, in creating so many alter aspect parts of myself between zero and five, and then in re-traumatizations, creating more as I grew older, um, because I learned subconsciously to do that, um, I felt like I left the good in those houses. I didn't have to go back to find the bad. I wanted to find the good. Um, see, we always know when something bad happens to us, we know it. On a heart level, our brain just won't um, compute with our heart. So, um, we can apply meanings to things and, and even a blanket could hold the energy like I remember thinking even back then I guess I was crossed between a born-again Christian a I was a little bit of everything I was a whole lot of really strict Catholic trying to be born again and new agey too and it drove my kids crazy because they didn't know what church is she bringing us to this time Mormon church, Islam, what? Because I was going all over because I never felt good enough with God, but that's a whole other story that I can't talk about now. Um, this story is about this blanket. When my therapist gave me this blanket, the first thing I thought is, oh, I wonder if you've put this around other people and what they've gone through, and I don't want that on me. Like, like there was this superstition energy thing, like, I don't want to pick up on that. But because it was coming from a good place from him, 
and I knew the hands that knit this loved him and I knew he wanted the best for me um, I took this and made it comfort comfort okay but we can have inanimate objects that hold energy that is nasty energy and we can feel it so um, be careful what you bring in your home and pray over it. That just pray over it. Don't give it too much meaning. Just pray over it. That's why when people, um, I had a friend of mine that was a buyer and she was a thrifter, a collector. She was a collector. Um, huge amounts of stuff she collected, and her home was just full with all this stuff. <laughs> I think she was a hoarder, but she she went and set up every week and sold right. And there would be, sometimes she would find things and she'd be like, I, I got this for you. Um, and I wouldn't accept it because I could feel the energy on it. I'd be like, no, that's okay. Um, so when you take things into your home from garage sales, thrift stores, um, basket, or basket, <laughs> basement sales, whatever it is, home, real estate, things, um, Pray over them. Just pray over them. Um, and be aware of that. Um, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. So, getting back to Navajo knitting and how I ended up with this from a seven ounce skein of yarn that looked like this is how thin it was, right? Navajo knitting or stockpile chaining was invented for the purpose of thin yarn. This is Aunt Lydia's, no, this is Bernay, Bernay number one, mercurized cotton. Um, it was made for cottons, fingerling, sock yarns, zip. Okay. Um, to bump up, because they didn't have eight, seven, sixes, fives, chunkies, and all these. So what they would do back in the day is they would make an elongated slip knot, get their hand in there, and they would pull a loop through, and then turn this the opposite way. And now you have a loop here. Your tail is up here, and you just keep pulling. About an arm's worth. Right? Look for you. And now you have three strands of yarn. So this, knitting this, would be more like a sock yarn now. Okay. So if you did you imagine if you did this with a two fingerling or a um, three DK sports, um, you're just gonna go up to like a five or a six or a seven or some of those big yarns that are really expensive. Um, so some people, uh, like I've said, in I think I did a video on one of my channels about Navajo knitting before. Um, but I wanted to show you how important this is, especially in economic times like this. Um, this is one seven ounce game, okay? You need 12 super, where are my knitting needles go? So you need six. I want to show you how this works out. Oh, here. I'll put them. I'll put it on a chair here. So I am going to make this for my doctor, who is now older. And I am going to bring him back this. Fixed. And then offer him this, right, as a gift. So I've got this all looped together, right? And even though it looks like not much there, I'm just going to show you what it works up to be after. And I'm using a 10 millimeter 15 needle. The pattern calls for a 12.5. Um, 17 US needle. And a 29 inch. I think I'm using a 30, 34. But some kind of a interchangeable or or circular needle that's larger to hold your stitches. So 
What I'm going to do is get a few stitches on here just so I can show you. Well, actually, you know what? I'm going to do a different cast on. A little easier. All right, so I'm just going to do a long tail cast on with a few stitches. I want you to see how much this bumps up to a six, almost more. It's more like an eight. You're going to shoot for a gauge of eight stitches, stock a net, which means you're going to knit one row, purl back the next row, knit one row, purl one row. You're going to do that eight stitches over 12 rows. Take your measuring tape or your ruler, unblocked, and when you get to four by four inches or 10 centimeters, you've got the proper gauge for a 44 by 44 in a thick yarn. Okay. So I'm doing a long tail cast on. There are plenty of tutorials out there. So I think it's important to recognize when we're done needing something and when we're ready to gift something back to someone who has given us so much, right? Because um, we don't want to be dragging around security blankets and tools that we've used that we don't need anymore. Um, so how this came to be that I ended up with the blanket is I had to have this medical procedure and my, believe me, I get back to the point. I go around in a circle, but I get back. And my doctor said, can I do to help you? What can we say? And basically, he wrote up a postcard for me to bring in in case, in case I switched out at the time and uh, somebody d didn't want to talk was there. Um, I could hand them a, but I, I stayed together and, you know, um, handed the postcard to the nurse, felt like an idiot in my 30s, 30s, but it was from my doctor, and he said, saying you can trust me is a trigger for Maria. Saying it's okay, you'll be okay with me. I would never hurt you, or this might hurt, or, or it's only going to last a minute. Things like that, you're protected, you're safe, were triggers for me. What worked for me was just hand Maria some warm blankets and let her do what she needs to do with them to comfort herself. So that became how I dealt with triggers in a very re-traumatizing, triggering situation was blanket and warmth. Um, so they gave me extra white warm blankets and I made it through the procedure just fine. All right, so this is a smaller sample, so this is what it's going to look like for the four. Um, medium most weight value yarn. Let's see, it's just the beginning. I'll show you in different ways. And then, um, I just want to knit up. I'm going to knit, purl. In fact, let me do this. Yep. You just have to make sure to get through the three strands on your return and when you enter the stitch. So I'm just doing a um, knit, purl. I'm just going to do a, like a ribbing just to show you how it works out a little bit. And then I'll come back and do the video of this actual pattern real quick. Did I get 83? 83 stitches is the cast on. So when you knit, you have the yarn in the back. When you purl, you have the yarn in the front. You have to make sure to get through the three stitches. Okay. And on the return. Otherwise, you won't really drop a stitch, like have a hole or a space in your work. Instead, you'll have these weird, wonky-looking strands just kind of hanging out. When you knit, it will look like a V. When you purl, it will look like a wrap. 
So an easy way to remember your work when you're basically you're going to be purling seven stitches, then knitting seven stitches, then purling seven stitches, knitting seven stitches. And then the next row you'll be doing whatever it tells you to do. It might be the opposite. It might be the same thing. Um, in the first set of boxes, and in the second set of boxes, you're just doing the opposite of the first set of boxes. For the particular pattern with a six bulky to get to a 44 inch uh, throw blanket or lap can, you're going to want to um, do the first set of boxes and the second set of boxes that are in the pattern. And then repeat that seven times. And then do your 10 row double mossed border. Um, if you're following the 83 stitches, you're going to do 10 stitches on each side that are double mossed also. Okay. So you can see here, I'm using 6 stitches on this one and 10 rows here. And it's reversible, so it'll look the same on both sides. So you would stop 10, if you follow the pattern, 10 stitches before you get to the end. Okay. So I just want to show you how much this bumps this up. And then we're not joining with the cord, we're just... But you do want to make sure you come around your yarn this way or you'll get trapped in the inside. Just It's a pain in the butt. So now I'm just going to knit what I see here. Actually, yeah, I'm going to knit what I see. So. In some of the pattern, you will be knitting what you see, and right here is a good example. So there's only two strands on this one. It's right here. You got to remember to pick those up. So on this row, and get them to go through too. Okay. So I am just following what I see now on this row. And that's how this pattern works. And then on the next row, you'll be doing the opposite of what you see. So it's called knitting what you see. That's really all double moth is. Is um you see that bump, you you purl it, you see the V. You gotta kind of pull down on some of the stitches until you actually get enough of them to see. You can see already how big that's gonna be and how cozy it's gonna be. So if you just continued knitting what you saw on every row, you would have a rib stitch, like a ribbing for a hat or a collar or whatever. You don't want that. But there will be a couple of rows where you're going to be, they're going to be lining up. You'll be knitting what you knit and purling what you purl. And then there'll be a couple of rows where you'll be doing the opposite, which makes it look like, some people call this like a seed stitch or a box stitch, um, double moth stitch. You just basically, the way the double moth stitch goes, I'll tell you really quickly, is row one, you're going to knit a setup stitch. And then you're going to purl knit, purl knit, purl knit to the end. You're going to end on a knit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're going to knit one as a setup stitch. Then you're going to purl knit, purl knit, purl knit to the end. Um, row two, you're going to purl one as a setup stitch and knit one, knit one, knit one to the end, and you will be, um, or knit one, purl one. <laughs> so you will end on a purl one. Row three, you're going to um, do the same as row two, and row four, you're going to do the same as row one. And then you just repeat that another four rows. You do four rows. One, two, three, four. One is the same as four. Two and three are the same. Um, and then 
you do that four more times and then you just do row one and two and that is the border. That is the first ten rows. Four and four is eight and then the two more of ten. So just a little example so you can see how much that bumps up. And believe me, nobody nobody's gonna know that you knit three together, like th that you loop that together. It comes out looking the same, especially if you block it. Um, so this is a cool little trick just to just want to do that's just two rows. That's just the cast on in two rows. So it's a quick knit. And I think these make beautiful prayer shawls um, and lap cans. And I think you can make them baby gans by just using like a stripe or a cotton yarn or um, you know like a striped out yarn or like a pastels for Easter. That'd be so pretty, a little basket weave uh, blanket. Um, perfect in a baby yarn with all the babies being born from quarantine. <laughs> Showers coming up. And then it also makes a really beautiful christening blanket. If you do it in like pure white, it would make a really pretty um, blanket. But you could do mangans that you can, you know, find colors like, you know, neutrals and stuff like this and that men love. And um, the accent pieces, maybe one for your cottage or your porch or your deck when it gets a little chilly. It's just really a cool pattern. Um, and you can change, as long as you know how many stitches to put on, you can change the uh, squares, like this one here is not seven stitches, it's, let me see, it's 12 stitches. So it's 12 down and twelve. So it's 12, it's, it's 12 rows of 12 knit, 12 per what it is. So I mean you can play with it a little bit. You could you if you want tiles like long long tiles and you want them to go in different directions which is what this is doing. Which is why I couldn't figure it out until I saw this pattern. <laughs> so um I think it's important to close therapeutic work with a counselor. Um by, especially if they gifted you, to gift them back. Um, and it to be meaningful to your work you've done together. So, um, if you're an artist and you like to draw, maybe that therapist or counselor had you draw your feelings, you can make a pretty painting or something for them, right? I don't know what they like. Um... Or something you thought was broken. Like, I mean, I really thought this was ruined. But it's not ruined. I'm just going to wash it again. I'm going to do a little duplicate stitch over it with the yarn I found. And then I make a new one for you. Um, so with this pattern, I wanted to say it is the pattern number I wanted to give you before I leave, right? I can't really, I'm not sure if I can show you the pattern. I'll come back and show you some of the stitches. Um, you're going to cast on 83. You're going to use a super bulky or you're going to bulk up your stash yarn. I would not change colors because you can see the floaters and the changes of color. doesn't look good. Um, but if you had a whole bunch of balls of like a fleck yarn or a tweed yarn, you could work that all the way through. Or even a variegated yarn. If that's what you had, you keep working it through. Um, or a solid color. Um, okay, so where is the? Oh, there it is. Okay, so the pattern number is LM6056, designed by an Italian story design team. Okay. They're using Red Heart Ore. Um, 12 balls, 3.5 in the color 
5360 Caramello. So last I priced it, it was $10.99 a skein. And I just can't afford that. So this is going to work out fine. This color, if you're interested, is called Buff Beige. Super value, $2.94 for each 7 ounce skein and $6.99 for a um, a jumbo. Okay. And then there is a chart. You want to do the chart. And if you're somebody that likes to be free from your computer like I do, um, you could just put, what I do is I just put a piece of paper up or above it so I know which, and I just retape it or set it down so I know which, where I am. Or you could take your chart, if you're a chart person, and upload it to paint or an editor of some kind um, where you can blow it up and just use one of the highlighters as you're working on each uh, row. So it would go left to right. Um, so you would go like left, one, right, to right. And just keep going. But that's how it would go. Um, or if you really, this pattern was so simple that once you get going with it, you're going to remember it. You're going to set it down, pick it up, and go, oh, yeah. You're going to be able to count your boxes and know, oh, there's two sets of boxes. That's one repeat. And if you put it down in the middle of like, knitting or purling, you'll be able to look and say, oh look, I have little knits here, V-shapes. So I must have to do purls next. Just follow it. So then you'll see, you'll see these little bumps down here. See those little bumps? Those are purls. So it's very easy to read on both sides. You know where your purls are. And you know where your knits are. Now if you pull enough, there's an it looks like a knit in between it, but yeah. So I just wanted to share that with you and share my little story of how a blanket really got me through this blanket, got me through probably seven of the twenty-eight years that were really bad. And a time that I was in a hospital too. That I needed comfort. And I was completely alone. And I mean, just don't home. Alone. Um, but I had God. I always have God. So, and then I'm going to show you a cute little pattern I found. It petals to picos. And it's not blocked and stiffened yet. i got to cook up my cornstarch and stir it till it's translucent and cooled and then set this in it. But, it's a beautiful cross from Easter. And it's a free pattern. And there's some beautiful free patterns there. And there's also a really cool, like if you're into decorating your door or something, um, I'm going to be putting this on my front door on a canvas with some daffodils and doves and things. Um, there we go. Now, the pattern is you do it in this kind of yarn. But I used... I used white Super Saver Red Heart for medium worsted weight yarn and a 3.75 crochet hook. So there's only two special stitches you need to know how to do to do this and that's the puff stitch and a long single crochet. And then of course you gotta pin this out and you block it and then it will be better. So petals to picots, free patterns that are really beautiful. Another place that has really pretty pretty free patterns is bellacrochet.com. Um, so check it out. Okay so I'm gonna go. Thanks for hanging with me on a Monday. I see snow so I'm gonna go make some soup. Take care everyone. Bye bye. Make it a good day.